I don't know if in the back you guys can hear me because the speakers are in front of you, but thank you for being here. I know that you have lives and Christmas celebrations and all of that, so thank you for being willing to come out on Christmas morning. We greatly appreciate it. I also want to offer up a thanks to, um, to the staff. I've known a lot of pastors over the years and a lot of pastors of rather large churches that have rather large staffs, and usually around the Christmas time, around Thanksgiving, staff starts to lobby about can we not do, especially when it all packs together on a weekend and, okay, Christmas Eve is on Sunday. Can we just skip Christmas for services and that kind of thing? We've got family stuff, and we, we try to be sensitive to that. But if you look right up here, so many of your staff that have no responsibilities are here, and you've seen them yesterday when they had no responsibilities. You saw them last night when they had no responsibilities. You saw them serving out there. And I just want, it says something about this church that the people that you pay to work here want to be with you even when they don't have to be with you. So for those of you who are able to be here and are willing to be here and not because you were told to be here, thank you very much. And Mo, and, and Mo, thank you. I threw it at her just about a week ago. I'd like to have a children's message. And that was the shortest and most succinct. succinct. If you knew how much time she put in putting those ribbons on those on those bows and how much time was spent this morning untangling them. We had, Doug and I did, we did a man fix. We just, they were so tangled up with it. I brought scissors and we started cutting. Um, so uh, I want to start off with something that one of those prayers, it was probably the one from the 500s. Is that the second one? Um, didn't say this line exactly, but was close. Um, the sun, S-O-N, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The author of Hebrews tells us that about Jesus, that he, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That is something that we as Christians understand, but it's something that many in, in the world are blind to. And before we pray, I want to give you, I just want to tell you a little story. Um, this is from the Christmas of 1879. It's funny how we're all going way back in time. Um, this is a reporter. He claimed to be an agnostic, which means, I don't know, right? It's, it's unknown or un, I, it's, not un, it's not that you don't have wisdom. It's that you don't have knowledge, agnostic. But he was kind of, some of his articles were kind of angry toward the church. And so he was this is back in the day when you, didn't, you couldn't just get online and you didn't get the, the, right after Thanksgiving, you didn't get the Black Friday sales in the, in the, in the paper, that, sun, that, that, that weekend paper that's that thick. You couldn't hop online to see what was, what, what was for sale. You might have had a Sears and Roebuck catalog, but by and large, the way you found out what new toys, what new things were available is you went to Main Street and you walk down the street, and there were these big presentations, these almost galleries that people spent <laughs> months creating in these picture windows where people, where the term window shopping comes from. And this reporter was downtown and saw three little girls standing in front of one of those picture windows, um, gazing at the, the, the new toys in 1879. Sure, they were high tech. <laughs> but one of the girls was blind. And coming closer, he heard the, two, the, the other two trying to describe the playthings to their friend. And he said that he had he'd never thought of how difficult it would be to explain what something looks like to someone who has never been able to see. That incident became a basis for a newspaper story. Now, a couple of weeks later, he ended up going to a church service where the evangelist Dwight L. Moody uh, was preaching. But he went with the attitude of, I'm going to find him in an inconsistency, and I'm going to tell the world that this guy, he might, he might be a Christian, he might believe what he says, but he doesn't really know what he's talking about. His purpose was to catch him in an, in, in an inconsistency, and he was greatly surprised when Moody stood up and used his newspaper article about the two girls explaining to the one blind friend who could not see what, what was behind there. And the preacher said, just as the blind girl could not visualize the toys, so an unsaved person can't see Christ in all his glory. He said that God opens the eyes of anyone who acknowledges his sin and accepts the Savior in humble faith. 
And just as any good preaching illustration should end, that was the beginning of a process of that reporter coming to Christ. God used something that he noticed to show him something he did not notice. And God began to open his eyes because he was humbled when he went to say, I'm going to find something wrong with this guy. And he ends up, that man uses his thing to communicate to him his need for Christ. So Christmas, someone said, I, I can't remember who it was. I was opening the doors for people out here. And, and I said, Merry Christmas. And, and she said, Merry Christmas. And she's right. And Christmas is about Christ, and Christ is a gift. I don't think we always see it that way, but Christ is the gift. It's not what he did. It's not what he said. It's not that he was born. It's not just that he was humble. It's not the, it's not the suffering. It's not the miracles. It's not the teaching. It's not the, the, the healings. It's not the, the passion, which is when he was uh, arrested and tried and crucified. It's not his death. It's not his resurrection. All those things are necessary for this, this term we use for the gospel, the good news. But the gospel is not the gift. Christ is the gift. So we're going to talk about gifts today, and we're going to talk about um, different ways to receive gifts. We're going to talk about what it means to be West Michigan polite when you get a gift that you don't like. You all know it. But then we're going to go back to Genesis 15 for a moment and see why the people were so anticipating a conclusion or a, a culmination of the promises that God had made. And it was fulfilled in the birth of Christ. It began its fulfillment in the birth of Christ and then moved through right till today. So let's pray together. Jesus, you are the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his essence, his presence, his all that he is. The fact that we can know God personally blows me away. It doesn't blow me away as often as it should, but it does, Lord. So we want to hear from you. We want to hear from Matthew. We want to hear from Moses. We want to hear, we want to hear from you and your people. So, Lord, stand in my shoes. Give me your thoughts. Speak with my mouth. And give us eyes to see only what you want to show us, ears to hear only what you want to tell us, and hearts to receive only what you want to give us. And we know that what you want to give us is Jesus. Praise us in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Spirit, for the glory of God our Father. Amen. So two passages today, and then I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go back and I'll summarize another. Um, Matthew chapter 1, it's interesting to me, we've been in We've been in Luke primarily throughout Advent. We've been the songs of Advent. And so we, we hear of the angel showing up to Mary, a preteen girl. She responds with a song. We hear the angel shows up to Zechariah. He responds with a song. We hear about Mary going to visit Elizabeth and John the baptizer in utero leaps in his womb for joy because he's in the presence of the Messiah who's barely past being a zygote. We hear of the angels talking to the shepherds, and we hear of, of Simeon waiting, an old man waiting because God had promised him and told him that he would not pass away until he met the Messiah. So that's a lot that Luke covers, and I find it, and we'll find out a little bit more about this Next week, when Pastor Doug talks about what the meaning and what, 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 the, what the, the benefit of being in God's Word really is, uh, and we're going we're gonna to launch this new reading thing next year to read all four Gospels all the way through four, three times in a year. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's interesting to me that we have, we have four different Gospels, and what, what Matthew does with the birth of Jesus, the infancy narrative, is very different than what Luke does. And Mark doesn't even have an infancy narrative, the birth of Jesus, and John does it completely differently. But what I think is curious, and what you may not know, is that Luke's gospel had circulated so well that 
that Christians who were reading Matthew's gospel didn't need all the specifics because they had it. They already had it. So he just gives them a summary of what they already knew. And it reads like this. The birth of Jesus Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to pub, excuse me, to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until, he gave, until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So one, two, three paragraphs in Matthew that took two chapters and two of the longest chapters in Luke to tell. Now here's why I bring up those differences. The early Christians were so well-versed on all that God had told, all that God had said, and all the promises that God had made, that, that when they heard the story, they owned it. It became them. It became theirs. And it's not just that the story became theirs. They, told, they, they gave it away. And so Matthew has no need to say, this angel, that angel, this person responded, this person responded, this is where they went, census was called, they had to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and then from Bethlehem to, to Jerusalem for the circumcision. He didn't have to tell them all that, because they knew it. And we know it here, but do we know it? There's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, not specifically speaking about Jesus being the gift, but you're going to hear this a couple of times in this message. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. And then preachers love, especially if they're going to give one of these sermons, preachers love a passage out of, out of Romans, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And it is. I mean, what we earn from our sin is eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death. But then there's a comma. But the gift of God is everlasting life in, not through, not with, not from, but in Christ Jesus. So there's a something that sometimes, sometimes, not accusing anybody, but sometimes we miss. We miss the fact that it's not just about Jesus. It is Jesus. That Christmas isn't just a nice little thing that God became a baby. He humbled himself. He, he, Christmas is Easter. And Easter is Christmas. Jesus is the gift. Have we received it? So think about that. It was Christmas morning, and I'm guessing that most of you have already done the unwrappings and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know who the dad in, in your family is, but there's always someone that as soon as the wrapping paper goes on the floor, he's like, put it in the bag. Right? But I don't know, when you were growing up, go back for a while, back to the 1879, some of us, when you had to go look and, and, and dream about something in a window. Um, but when, you remember, there was, there's almost always a family member who gives you that which you do not want. Like I, I had a relative that would send socks. We lived a thousand miles away and they sent socks, a great big old pack of socks, like you would get at Frankenmuth or something like that, you know, and and one time, I was 13 years old, I got a leather bracelet about that wide with my name stamped in it. When you're 13 years old, you go to the, I'm going to the junior high dance, I'm Trent. You know, I, I don't want that gift. I don't want, you know, so when you get it, you look at it and you go, and fortunately for that relative, it was a thousand miles away, so I didn't have to look at him and go, thank you, and give a big hug, because that's, the, that's kind of the West Michigan polite thing to do, right? When you get a gift that you don't really want, and you're sitting in the room with a person, you prepare yourself. Men, we fake reading the whole card, right? Especially if it's one of those long ones, and then there's Henry, I just saw one husband go, yep. Um, because to, <laughs> we know it's polite to read it. And someone spent time either buying it or writing in it or doing both. 
And so we, we walk through it. It's not meaningful, but we're trying to get to the good stuff. And when you get to the good stuff and you open it up, and, and you kind of have in mind what, oh, please, please. And then you go, thank you. Right? You, you've, you learn. The West Michigan play, you learn to, in our family, you walk over to the person, you take a picture with the gift and the person, you give them a hug and you thank them for it, whether they liked it or not. Even if I'm in Boston and I get gift cards for a Boston only pizza shop. Even if I get a coffee mug warmer that's supposed to go on my desk, even though I don't really drink coffee. It doesn't matter what I wanted. What matters is what it is, what's polite society say. I'm supposed to be grateful that someone thought of me ahead of time and offered me something that I did not buy, I did not earn, and that was, the cost was theirs. But we've all seen people that don't know that yet. My daughter, when she was two and a half or three, this was either 1994 or 1995, Christmas, my mom, my, my poor mom, single mom, four boys, her brother, three boys. My mom was as girly a girl as they came. Artist, ballet dancer, all that kind of stuff when she was growing up. And she just, she was, she was good with her boys, but man, she wanted a girl in there somewhere. So I marry a woman, and that woman produces a granddaughter for my mom. And she is stoked. And she waits, you know, a couple of years till she can walk and talk to us, so she can appreciate music. And she, she, got, she gets a gift for Elise that she could not wait for her to unwrap. But she's two and a half or three and a half years old, and she's learned that grandma gives toys. And so when my daughter unwrapped this tutu, she was, she was tearing into it, and she, this pink tutu, and she went and began to cry because she didn't get a toy. Now, it killed my mom, and my daughter still thinks that my mom is still offended from 27 years ago. I don't know that that's true, but my mom learned a lesson, never give a child a gift that doesn't also include a toy. Now, what my mom didn't know, and what Elise didn't know, is that would, that tutu would end up being something that Elise loved more than any other gift she had received. She would wear it for dance parties, she would pretend to do ballet, her and her cousin, and she wore it longer than she should have. You know, when kids get old, that they still have a favorite thing, you know, like when the little boys have the PGA top that comes to here. So she hadn't learned yet what it means to be polite in receiving a gift. But I, I find it curious, though, that, that there are certain ways that we should not receive a gift. There are certain things that when you give a gift, you want the other person, you, you want them to appreciate it, right? Even if you know they're having to fake it a little bit, but none of us want what, what my friend Bert Bolt got from his son, um, Cohen. And Cohen is the sweetest I think one of the sweetest boys that God has ever created. And I asked last week, if this happens, send me a photo. So Cohen, um, when they were wrapping gifts and putting them under the tree, this is what he was playing with. And oh, by the way, he's the sweetest kid on the planet. It's not his fault. His dad is an Ohio State fan. Okay, don't hold it against Cohen. Bert, maybe, but not Cohen. So he, we call that in my family a dirter. It's the inside tube thing of paper towels or, 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 okay? So give me a couple more of those of him. So he spent about half an hour playing with the dirter. A couple more. Okay, and then on Christmas, or yes, Christmas Eve yesterday, he opened, up, he opened up a gift. He loves dinosaurs. He opened up a gift, and look what he played with. <laughs> He's playing with a box. Now, which one of us have not experienced that sometime in our lives where you, you go through all this and the thing that your kid loves is the box or the wrapping paper or something other than the gift itself. Now, Cohen will love those dinosaurs because that box will not last long. In fact, his dad might have already taken it, uh, cut it down, flattened it out, and put it in the recycle bin. I don't know. But the fact that I asked them because I knew I was going to talk about this today and it happened just, I love it. So little Cohen loves dinosaurs and loves dinosaur boxes. Now, none of us would ever do anything like this with the gift of Christ. But sometimes, sometimes we get caught in the trappings, the wrappings, or we play with the box. Sometimes we take the symbol of the gift and treat it as if it is the gift. Worship services, music styles, um, preaching styles, 
When you meet with people and you pray with them, do they pray the way you want them to? There are ways and times that we get caught up in, in our stuff and we kind of forget that it's what's in the box. It's what the box represents that's the gift. And we do, those of you who, who are in daybreak most of the time, you don't get to hear this very often because we, every, every time we do a baptism, we give each child one of these boxes. This is just a sample. But what we do is we put a letter inside it that talks about what happened at baptism um, and it's dated, and their name is inscribed on the bottom, and uh, the date of their baptism is here, and then it's wax, hot wax is, is put on there, and it's stamped with a cross shape. And so the, the point of it is that to remind parents that when your children ask, what's that box, you tell them what Christ has done for them, right? But the other thing it symbolizes is this, that every Bible-believing Christian today believes that whatever, whatever's necessary for salvation has already been achieved. That the, the birth, the Christmas story, the life, the teachings, the miracles, the suffering, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension, that which is needed for everlasting life, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus. That's already been completed. So every time we do a baptism, we get to remind people that, look, it's just, it's just a box. It's just water on a head, but it tells us something deeper. It tells us something more. Because when the kids break the seal, when they receive the gift of salvation for themselves and they break the seal, it's just a letter. It's a piece of paper with toner on it. Because... What's in the box, and the box itself, is not meaningless because it's symbolic, but it's not the actual gift. Are you playing with the box? Or have you received Christ as your gift? Some of the other ways we receive gifts is we, we get gift cards, and then we get to redeem them, which means to buy back, by the way. We get to redeem them for what we want, when we want. Jesus is not a gift card. And you probably have someone in your family, like I have in, in my extended family, it's not one of my own children, that no matter what you give them, they want the receipt because they're never satisfied with what's been given. They want to take it back and return it for what they want. So that's, what, that's the person you give gift cards to. But you don't get a receipt from the gift of Christ because you only get the receipt if you've actually received the gift, and there is no one who actually receives the gift that wants to give it back. So I'm going to go back to Genesis 15. Those of you, I've been here 11 years. Those of you who uh, have been here for a while, you've heard me summarize this before, and the reason for doing it today is simple. The people of God, when Jesus showed up, knew about this promise from God. We kind of forget about it because we already have the gift. But the father of the faith, Abraham, God told him that his children, his descendants, will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, the seas on the seashore. But then God made a covenant with him. One night when, when Abraham was sleeping, God gave him a vision, and he told him, this is kind of gross, but we're not ancient, nomadic, Semitic people. Abraham was. He, he told him to grab a bunch of animals, cut them in half, some big, some little, dig a trench, and let the blood flow down into the middle of the trench. And Abraham knew what was happening because um, this is how ancient nomadic Semitic people would make covenants with one another, one family to another. This, this man's daughter is going to marry this man's son, and they would make a covenant. If my daughter is not everything that I claim she will be, if my son is not everything I claim he will be, you can do this to me. You can cut me in half, walk through and dance in my blood. So Abraham, having a vision from God, when God is represented as a smoking fire pot or fire, Abraham, when God walks through it, and he's basically saying, Abraham, if I, if I do not keep the covenant that I've made with you and all of your descendants to come, you can do this to me. You can spill my blood and walk through it. And Abraham knows what's coming. He knows that he's going to now have to say in front of God that if me or any of my descendants do not keep the covenant that I make with you, you can do this to us. And that is the expectation. But what God decides to do is to say to Abraham, that's not how it's going to work this time. God said, if I do not keep the covenant that I've made with you and your descendants, 
you can spill my blood and dance in it. I'm summarizing. This is in Genesis 15. You're welcome to read it. And Abram, Abraham, if you, any of you, if you or any of your descendants from here until forever break the covenant that you've made with me, you can spill my blood and dance in it. So the people of God, for a couple of thousand years, were waiting for the time because they knew they had sinned. They knew that they'd messed up. You, you, the cycle of apostasy, how many people, how many times people again and 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 again saw the faithfulness of God and re- responded with unfaithfulness. But the people knew. They knew of this promise. They knew of this covenant. It was on their minds. And they knew that God promised through other prophets that he would send someone that we would kill and his blood would save us. So when the angel shows up, and talks to Simeon, when the angel shows up and talks to Mary, when the angel shows up and talks to Zechariah, and he uses words like, today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. When, when, when John the baptizer, w- later on, when he, when, when he meets Jesus and he says, this is a man whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, they knew what it meant, do we? Do we truly receive the gift of God, which is everlasting life in Christ Jesus? In our culture and even in some of our own lives, we we respond to God's gift of Christ in a way that none of us would ever want anyone to receive, to respond to a gift that we gave them. And that's fear. You ever want to give someone a gift and they go, well, maybe, as just a kind of a startle thing. But you don't want someone terrified for their own existence because of something you bought, paid for, wrapped, and presented. But if you think about it, that is how many of us, especially in our culture, but certainly biblically, how people responded. Mary was terrified. Angel told her not to be afraid. Joseph was afraid to to take Mary as his wife, had to be convinced. Herod wanted to kill Jesus because he was afraid he would take his throne The shepherds were afraid when they received the birth announcement. The religious leaders were afraid that he wouldn't be who they wanted him to be. The zealots were afraid that he wouldn't wouldn't be enough. The the leaders, the the political leaders were afraid um, because of the instability of the empire. The disciples were afraid when he walked on water. And John the baptizer was afraid that maybe he had opened the wrong gift. People are afraid of Jesus. And sometimes I am too because of what he calls me to, what he wants from me, what he's going to change in me. They're not mad or they're not, they're not angry and they're not, they're not afraid of Jesus because he's cruel. He's kind. He's gentle. Take my yoke upon you. If you're weary, I'll give you rest. But we're afraid of Jesus because he isn't safe. To reject Christ is to accept self and to say, I am the God of my life. To accept Christ is to give up control of my life. He gave his life for me. I give my life to him. That's frightening. It's actually terrifying. Jesus is not a gift card that can be redeemed for what you want and when you want. And praise be to God for this indescribable gift. The gift is Christ himself. Praise be to God for this indescribable gift. The gift, the son, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And we get to see the humility of God at Christmas because he tells us that even though I'm all powerful, I'm powerless. Even though I'm all seeing, I can't see beyond the length of my arm even though I can move anything with a word, I have no vocabulary when he's an infant. He decided to become one of us so that we could understand who he is. And the only way that we could ever understand who he is is that he gives us eyes to see and ears to hear it. That we're not blind. We don't have to, to, to depend on other people describing what's behind the, the gift window. He reveals himself to us. But if you're someone sitting here today that has that, it's like, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't really see it. 
Okay. Remember what Dwight Moody said, that he opens the eyes of anyone who will humbly confess their sin and receive the gift of Christ. That's why Jesus often said, let those who have eyes to see, let them see. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Because God is a humble God, we have to come to him humbly. He offers us the gift of eternity. And sometimes we just play with the box. Or we play with the wrapping paper. Or we play with the dirt. And I just hope, and it's just my job to remind you today, I hope you don't play with the box. I hope you receive the gift of everlasting life that is in Christ Jesus. And remember that it, Christmas isn't the gift. Easter isn't the gift. The miracles aren't the gift. The teachings aren't the gift. He's the gift. And the beauty of this gift is that not only can we receive it for ourselves, but we can never lose it. So if today is the day to receive that gift, do so humbly. If you've received it before, but you found yourself playing with a box, receive it again. And if you know that you know that you've received the gift of Christ, the person of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the comforter, lives within you, then spend your day praising God for this indescribable gift. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for agnostic reporters who can see what it means to not be able to see and then to hear your word in a challenge and respond to it with humility. Thank you, Lord, for all of us that we all come to you exactly the same way, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and a death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no one here who came to you any differently than anyone else. Humility, confession, and receiving the gift that you gave. We thank you that you're a giving God. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you that the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus. And it's in your name for your sake, and by your power, we pray to you. Amen.